Okay. Carmen. Carmen Lemere. So Carmen is uh, one of the co-instructors in, uh, in the PDC. And uh, she's got an absolute wealth of knowledge um, in everything from forestry to urban gardening to tomato growing to fungi. Uh, she's an incredible chef. She knows how to preserve food. I mean, she's basically like... A Swiss, goddess. A Swiss army knife. Well, a goddess Swiss army knife. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so today she's going to share some of her uh, incredible wisdom with you guys. And uh, I know there's going to be lots of questions that come on the back end of this. And uh, if you like this type of content, you can find uh, tons and tons of Carmen in our permaculture design course, which starts in November. So welcome, Carmen. Thank and you if there's so anything much. else you want to uh, let the, the crowd know about all of your incredible talents, please uh, continue <laughs> to elaborate. Oh, wow. Please, it's so great please, to be please, here, guys. Ask um, questions. And when you do, do a hashtag question. Um, and maybe, maybe even Carmen will share her smoked corn salsa recipe if someone asks really, really nicely. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag questions <laughs> let's let's fill the question sheet up for Carmen okay take it away Carmen awesome thanks guys I'm pretty excited to be here again in another summit it's just such a wonderful way for us to um, you know combine the social aspect of permaculture with the practical knowledge and I think building that community is key and we're definitely going to be um, looking at that a little bit more deeply through my presentation today. So I'm excited to share um, what I've got for you today. And I think uh, it will encapsulate some of the essence of, of the power behind urban permaculture. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, yep, there we go. There we are, okay, super. Well, let's get this very format. There we go. All right, so the theme of my presentation today is nurturing resilience and abundance with urban permaculture using uh, a lot of the strategies that um, that we're employing on our own urban property here in Calgary, Alberta, we're a zone three. Uh, sometimes, some seasons, some, some years we, we edge over into a little bit more zone, uh, zone four, but uh, with the hard winter that we're expecting today, I imagine that's, or this year, I imagine that's going to push us back a little bit further. So, um, cold climate is a big deal where we live. And so all of our resilience building strategies and abundance uh, you know, generating strategies are really, uh, you know, very contextual to, to our climate and our situation. So I uh, did a bit of research recently and found out that 56% of the world's population actually live in an urban environment. In Canada, that number shifts quite significantly to 82%, which was quite surprising to me initially. But then I thought, wait a minute, we have this massive land base um, and, and so few very large cities. And so it kind of does make sense to me that, um, that most, of our, most of our population are urban. So when it comes to looking at permaculture strategies and, and, um, and opportunities for building more resilience and abundance on our own properties, uh, you know, addressing the urban paradigm is really, really key. So one of the things that I was looking at was, okay, you know, we've got all of these folks that are living in urban environments, how are their needs getting met currently? And so I looked into all these various distribution patterns of various resources, not just food, which is super important where we live because of our climate, um, but, but, but for all of the other resources as well. So we have these very fragile systems, which, you know, I don't need to get into too much uh, detail about that, but we know that most of those are, are highly centralized, which, which, which gives such a high level of fragility that it really doesn't make sense to continue in that way. Then we've got these decentralized distribution patterns and then some distributed, um, less fragile uh, patterns. And so definitely we could see that as we move away from the centralized towards the more decentralized and towards the more distributed, and I'm going to give you another model later on in the, in the presentation, um, we, we increase our ability to, um, to, to build in more, uh, more, more less fragile systems and more resilience. So we're in this situation now where, you know, we have completely abdicated uh, responsibility for our own food supply. And it's, it's gobsmacking to me because, I mean, food is something we need in order to survive. How do we survive without food? And yet we have been seduced into 
abdicating this responsibility step by step by step, generation by generation, um, and and it it's 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 uh, it's kind of beyond belief when you think about it. it. Doesn't make any sense. So most of us source our food from only one location. So you know I will be focusing a little more on food in this presentation, but be clear that I'm talking about all of our resources here that we depend on. So that's the fact. Most of us source our food from only one location, which also adds to you know, uh, increased levels of fragility for our systems. Plus our food is coming from so, so far away. So if we're wanting to build less fragile food systems, of course we have to bring it home. We have to bring it in more locally. And I think that's where urban permaculture really, really shines is that you know, the hyper-local food production is really about your backyard and in and, and your community gardens and in your neighborhoods. So we've got, you know, the supply chain fragility in all different ways. And, and especially here in Canada, we have this, you know, and in the Northern States, we have this thing called winter, which, uh, you know, throws us into, you know, eight months practically of, of, of inability to actually be growing food, um, and where you know food isn't just readily available, it's not out in the fields. So our strategies for reducing those levels of fragility um, are, are really, really key. And we'll explore some of those. So 52%, 52.6% of Canadians are concerned about food supply shortages. And this was actually um, even before the pandemic. But now, um, you know, we've got as a result of that almost 20% of Canadians started growing food for the first time. And I mean, I've seen that in my own neighborhood. I've seen, uh, I live in a cul-de-sac here in Calgary and um, you know, we were the first ones to really start growing food. I've been on my property for about 30 years or so. And just through our passive influence in a way, uh, a lot of our neighbors are now growing food and people are, um, you know, coming to me and asking me for, you know, just neighbors asking me for advice, which is really great. So I'm seeing a real uptick in, you know, eco yard consultations, people wanting to grow their own food. Um, you know, the workshops that I offer through Urban Farm School, there's been a way more registration than that because people are really keen. And it's not just about, uh, oh, I've got nothing better to do with my time because I'm home all the time, so I might as well learn to garden. I think there's a there's been a shift in a way, a minor shift in a way from from you know gardening as a hobby right as a luxury hobby a free time hobby to understanding really how essential it is for us to grow our own food and then there's also you know food security issues and, and around food safety issues as well you know knowing that you can control the process from from seed to harvest you know not only is incredibly uh satisfying and empowering but it gives you control over the quality of your food so nutrient density is a big big deal this is my my mom's family. This is my mom here, the youngest of 10 kids. Uh, you know, we grew up uh, largely in North, northern Alberta. We moved all over the world into all kinds of different uh, situations in which, you know, the availability of food wasn't a given. But in my mom's era, I mean, if you didn't hunt for, forage, preserve, you know, grow a garden, if you didn't, if you didn't do all the things you needed to do, you didn't eat. And it would have been, you know, an unbelievable thing to not stock your root cellar during the winter because we have winter, we have such a long period of time. And so, um, you know, they were really, really, you know, intricately, intimately connected with food supply, with their food sources. And that's something that we have really lost. And, and the thing is, is I think it's such a privilege to be allowed to, to be able to have you know, even a pot to grow something in. We don't realize what a privilege it is until you travel somewhere where you have zero control over your food or the people don't have the space to plant anything in the ground. And I think that's something that we, we completely take for granted uh, is our food supply. And, uh, you know, nowadays, you know, we're instead of having a home pantry, uh, which totally makes sense in our climate, by the way, not just a little closet with a few cans in it and two weeks food supply, but considering our um, climatic conditions here where we live, having a serious home pantry is, it should be a standard in every home. Uh, but we have defaulted the responsibility for our own food supply, like I said, to this big box pantry that may be down the road. So that's become our pantry. So, so there's a massive level of fragility here, not just with the food supply, so the sourcing and the food supply chain, 
but actually with the, you know, the ability to, um, to make it through a long winter. So that, that's a big factor. So, you know, what, what does resilience really mean? What, is, what does it mean to be resilient? And I think we've got some ideas about that. Um, according to Webster's, resilience is the ability to recover from or adjust to change. But, you know, I, I think there's a better way, the old way and the new way. So if we can reimagine this concept of resilience and open our minds a little bit, we can see that we've got a number of ways of, of reacting to change. And sometimes it's change that makes us wake up to say, hey, I need to be a little more resilient. But that's a reactive response, which makes us quite fragile because we might not have the resources in place at that time in order to react in a positive way. However, if we take a proactive approach, we can start edging into that anti-fragile system. And, and I'd like to suggest that resilience can now become the ability to anticipate, adjust, and even flourish in the face of change, to look at the waves, right? To ride the wave and start, start looking at where your weakest links are, uh, not only in your food supply chain, but also in all of the other resources that you have um, available to you so easily today. So that brings us to this concept of resilience by design. And that's what I, what I love about uh, what we do with permaculture. And, and, and the whole mindset behind that is because, you know, resilience by design is very empowering. And, you know, I worked for years with the Alberta government um, in the fields of forestry, sustainable land management, and primarily around ecosystem health and dynamics. And, you know, looking at all the bioregions in Alberta and, and finding out what makes those tick and, and realizing how incredibly resilient natural ecosystems are and applying those same principles to social ecosystems is, is, is equally awesome. Uh, but you can see the design that's in, that's embedded in these multiple stacked matrices of relationships. Uh, it's just mind blowing how complex they are. And, and it's so complex, it makes it look simple. But if we can mimic those same strategies, uh, we can design resilience into our lives. And that's, that's why I love the permaculture um, lens. So this, these are some images from Robin, Michelle, and Dakota's uh, recent book, Building Your Permaculture Property, which I absolutely adore. And I really love this, this, uh, this distinction between a degenerative model, a sustainable model, and a regenerative model. And if you've read Robin Michelle's book, you'll, you'll, you'll have seen you know, very similar explanations in here. The degenerative model, which is basically a downward spiral, which means that, you know, based on the belief that human beings are better than mankind, are better than nature, I'm sorry, and that we can meet all of our needs at the expense of everything else. So obviously that is not something that can be even sustained over the long term, and it's focusing on meeting our needs today without concern for the future. The sustainable model, which is, you know, this, this great buzzword now, sustainability, 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 um, it's really this aspect of doing less harm, of focusing on, you know, almost maintaining status quo. Let's 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 not do anything, you know, more bad. Let's let's make sure that whatever we do is a little less bad. And it's based on the belief that human beings don't really have a right to exist on this earth, and that all we're doing is screwing everything up. Um, that humans are actually worse than nature. The regenerative model, which resonates very deeply, I believe, with most people, and I imagine almost everyone um, in the summit today will agree with this model, based on the belief that we are nature, that we are conscious members, mindful members of a community of, of, of beings, of sentient beings working together for the well-being of all. And, and that's, that's an important distinction because it means that we have a vested interest in, in um, you know, in, of course, meeting our needs today, but meeting our needs in the long term in a way that actually improves over time and provides more abundance and more resilience as time moves forward. So why, why permaculture? I think that permaculture, well, I know that permaculture provides us with this comprehensive methodical process and very positive solutions approach. That's what I love, the positive solutions approach for designing resilient productive systems for meeting our needs, guided by those core ethics of earth care, people care, and fair share. 
And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the bottom line for me is that there's, there's this methodical process that is comprehensive, very, very, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Very contextual. And, and so that is what kind of separates the, the, the design process from the implementation process that the tools and strategies that we will use to implement the design must be in context to, to your situation and your location on the planet. So, so that makes, you know, guided with all these beautiful uh, ethics and the principles of permaculture, um, we can design these incredibly resilient and abundant systems that meet not only our resource needs, but also our social needs. So I came up with this little, um, this little uh, slide for the PDC in which we can take all of the things that, 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 are, that are contextual to us and run, this, run them through this beautiful uh, you know, permaculture coffee filter and, and, and through the observation of patterns and, and flow and so on, uh, we can distill those down into this delicious design. And, and what, I, what I've noticed, and, and certainly that all, that all patterns, all energy you know, has patterns and all patterns have flow. And that flow, all those patterns and flow uh, will, will inform that actually you'll start to see properties emerge. And those properties will then help you design your, your site or your, or your organization um, or your business or your social structures. So you get this emergent design and those, those, that emergent design and those properties together are going to help inform your strategies and tools for actually implementing your design. So all energy has flow, all flow follows patterns, all patterns exhibit properties. And those are the properties that inform the appropriate strategies and tools. And so this is a very uh, a simple process. Of course, the design process uh, is much more complicated than this, but at its very base level, this is, this is kind of where it's at. So when we, when we look at linear systems, thinking sense design, you know, once we start to emerge out of that very limited way of thinking and start to embrace this holistic systems way of thinking, it's a new lens, we can easily transition from merely surviving to thriving. And that's where, you know, that new definition of, of resilience uh, comes into play. So our limited ability to solve problems, that's, we get this evolution of the ability to turn um, challenges into opportunities. So when we look at natural ecosystem design, uh, we know that there are some key uh, attributes to natural ecosystems that allows them to thrive. And so what are those? Well, diversity is a big key player, right? Diversity, connectivity, how many connections can we make? How many connections are there? What kind of redundancy can we, um, can we generate in the natural ecosystem? Is, this, is the ecosystem stable? So most, most natural ecosystems have achieved stability. That's not, doesn't mean they're static, but they are stable. Are they able to regenerate themselves? Are they able to improve over time um, and, and, and continue on their path of succession? And the resource efficiency, of course, now we've got all the niching and that's part of the diversity is part of that and the connectivity is all part of that. So the resource efficiency means there's no waste. So when we look at these kind of systems, we can easily apply the exact same attributes if we get it right to all of our human systems, our, our uh, you know, uh, urban planning strategies, our organizations, our large scale agricultural practices, our educational uh, um, institutions, our wild management, land management strategies, our businesses, our home gardens, et cetera. All of these can be brought into play in exactly the same way. And in doing so, we can build massive levels of resilience and abundance. So big question. You know, do I put out the big cash and, you know, go into debt and buy a property somewhere? Um, or do, you know, I mean, or do I hang out in, in the urban environment? There's just, sometimes this is a really big question for folks, especially our students. Sometimes the end goal for them is to get a piece of property. And in the meantime, they're not investing or flexing their design muscles on their own property. So, uh, you know, my strategy for today is really to focus on the urban environment and, 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 and see how much abundance and resilience we can achieve through that. So in an urban environment, we've got plenty of opportunities for impactful action. You wouldn't believe 
how many people we get through our property every year, like sometimes over 200 come for uh, permaculture tours or eco yard tours. And when they're in that space, it affects them so profoundly, you know, they, they want to go home and make a small change, even if, even if it's a small change. And, and I think we underestimate the power of taking even small actions. And, uh, and, and like Ben mentioned yesterday, you know, if, if there's only one thing you take away from the summit this weekend, it's to take some kind of small action. We've got lots of opportunities in urban environments for leveraging diversity, diversity of skill sets that are readily available, diversity of, of all kinds of materials, including surplus materials, diversity of culture and you know, food culture, really important to me, uh, diversity in, you know, with the wisdom, the wisdom diversity, that wisdom bank. Um, you know, plenty of opportunities to connect with that. And of course, in our growing systems, we, we, we would like to have plenty of diversity. Of course, there are many more ways to, uh, to leverage diversity, but these are just a few. Also, diversity uh, is available to us in the way that we source our food. We've got so many options for food sourcing in a city that don't require necessarily purchasing from a supermarket. Now you can see these circles going further and further out. Obviously, this home and community garden is, 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 is the hyper-local model that helps us build resiliency in our backyard. If we can't grow everything in our own backyard, then maybe we look either to direct relationships with local producers or we do like cooperative food buying clubs where we still have a center, it's just a little bit less centralized, but still a little bit of centralized. And then we've got the, the, the uh, producers, local producers. So this is really about creating relationships, right? Relationships. And then we've also got farmer's markets, which are a similar model, but there's so many options to buying from a supermarket. This is the most fragile. This is the most, uh, anti-fragile here. So leveraging that diversity of, of food sourcing options. Of course, shortening our food supply chain, super important. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, similar slides to this one. Um, and further away you move from this model here, the, the distance between garden to table, uh, the more fragile your system is. So we've also got plenty of opportunities for, for fostering productive and re uh, resilient relationships and harmonious supportive interconnections. So I'm just going to move my little box here so that I can see the rest of my slide. Okay, there we go. So the interconnectivity is a really important key and it's something that um, exists in spades in urban environments. There's so many opportunities for connection and multiple connections, which, which you know, actually build in that all important piece of redundancy that we're looking for. Oops, what happened here? So remember I showed you this slide earlier, decentralized, decentralized and distributed systems. So what if we could do something like this? This is a, this is a really anti this is, this is beyond resilient. This is an anti-fragile system where we've got hyper-local consumers and producers. So they are all connected with a whole bunch of people who aren't producers, but are definitely con uh, consumers in a very hyper-localized fashion. So you can imagine with all these levels of connectivity, we've got this web and you know how resilient a web is. And this, this is occurring on multiple levels, right? These are stacked matrices of relationships that go on and on and on and on and on. And the more of these connections you build on a hyper-local scale, the more anti-fragile your system is, the more it can weather the storm. So even in your own gardens. So this is an example of something that one of our students uh, submitted um, very similar to this. And I thought it was a very good illustration of, of how to create these multiple connections. So based on the needs and yields analysis, and, and if you've taken the PDC, you've seen this before, um, but if you haven't, this is a great exercise because it really shows you, um, you know, how many ways you can use the resources on your own property and, and understanding the needs uh, of all of your given elements. And these are only just a few of them in your system. You could see that you can get that same stack matrices of relationships. And you're basically creating systems that are much more closed loop, right? That are much more resource efficient. And that's what we're really looking for. And this can be done um, on multiple scales with any type of organization or home garden um, or large scale agricultural process. So, so if we looked at this where, where organizations were doing that needs and yields 
uh, multiple connectivity um, uh, process within their own organizations. And then, and then they created the same kind of network, mul multiple network with other organizations, school groups, community organizations, family groups. You can do this kind of exercise um, with absolutely everything, not just our food growing strategies, but all of our resource uses and all of our organizations, all of our social structures as well. And in so doing, we can build these more closed loop systems where we're meeting our needs locally and hyper-locally. So we've got this uh, strategy that we'd like, I'd love to work on with my community. Um, of course, resilience is a big deal right now. And so I'd uh, really like to, to, to create some sort of a skill bank in our own community where people come together and they willingly uh, create a basically a database of what what our, what our local skill sets are, right, in community. And I think that that not only will create greater levels of connectivity, you know, greater uh, opportunities for people to get to know each other, to create connections, but, but also makes us a lot less fragile in case of uh, any problems down the road. So we've got this idea of self-sufficiency that, you know, we need to be the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And, and, and that really implies that we have to produce everything ourselves and that we don't need any supplies or services from the outside. But really, in an urban environment, you can flip that on its head. You can say, self, you know, what about self-reliance? Self-reliance means I take responsibility for, 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 for my own household needs, but as part of a local resilient community. So I don't have to you know, I don't have to be the baker. I, I don't have to, to, to bake the bread. I can, my neighbor is baking, you know, eight loaves a week and, 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 and that's too much for them. And so I can purchase my, my bread from them or someone else is making beautiful ferments or, or my local neighbor is a, is an electrician and I'm happy to trade my canned goods for, for, you know, an hour of his time. Uh, you know, there's this, there's this wonderful opportunity to build a village, uh, economy, which is really, really key for building resilience in, in, a, in an urban environment. So of course, growing food is a big deal for us. Um, this is our front driveway. This is part of our backyard system. I love to see when people are challenging the urban model and getting out there and growing food in their front yards, um, getting creative with, with you know, uh, growing food in small spaces. Uh, this, this is key. And I think you know, when we do our open yard tours here, people come away with a whole bunch of ideas because we're using our yard also as a demonstration site for urban farm school students as well as the permaculture students. So we love, love to trial all different kinds of strategies here and it, and it allows people uh, to go home and, and try different things and, and know that, you know, challenging the front yard uh, landscape paradigm um, is, is a worthwhile endeavor. And I'll show you some pictures of ours in a little bit. This was our front yard. Uh, this is the property that I live in in Calgary. It's a two-story flat roofed house, which presents some challenges when it comes to rainwater harvesting. But uh, this front yard, this is pretty well what my yard looked like when I bought the property 30 years ago. And we started to transition that right away at the time of purchase. Uh, the first thing I did is I built compost bins in the backyard and knew that if this was a resource that I could, I could in reinvest into my landscape. So it was a very basic yard, uh, grass from stem to stern, front yard and backyard, of course. Um, but this is my property here. So, you know, really urban environment here. But we really, you know, um, I really had a vision for this for this property. I knew that it was possible to build much more abundance and, and really make that connectivity, that connection with my property. We moved so much when I was a kid. Um, you know, it was difficult for us to actually put down roots. And, and I, I knew when I found this property here in Calgary that this was going to be my home for a long time. And I wanted to get that, that sense of, of place. I really wanted to invest my time, my love, my energy and my resources into creating a nurturing environment for myself and my family. So this is what our property basically looks like now, 30 years later. So with some minor uh, shifts, you can see that's quite a, quite a difference between, between that and that. And, and basically this is, this is all uh, it's incredibly productive, really beautiful, very nurturing, and it meets 
it meets all of our needs as far as you know as human uh, you know our what our needs are as human beings we produce a ton of food we have beautiful gathering spaces lots of social spaces we've got uh, serenity zones where we can hang out and you know hide away for a bit we've got um We've, we, we've got lots of ecosystem health here, small greenhouse, lots of rainwater storage. It's so abundant right now. Um, it's unbelievable. You wouldn't believe the harvest. I just finished doing all my canning and I'm, and, and I'm like overwhelmed. It's been so much this year, but there's so much productivity that one can produce off of an urban lot. And, and, and the permaculture design process is, is really a valuable uh, designed, it's a valuable tool to help us get from what I used to have to what I have today and the level of productivity and ecosystem health and dynamics. So that's basically it. So I'm just going to show you some of our annual growing systems and kind of what we've been up to here. So on this property, we've got a number of areas where we're growing annuals and Annuals in a cold climate are very important and we should never, um, some people like to, uh, like to, to get a little bit down on the annual thing that it's all about perennials in permaculture, but that's absolutely not true. Especially if you live in a cold climate, you need to have good annual production in a very short season, very short period of time, uh, because these are the crops that will produce the highest calories for you in order to get you through the winter. So all of your root crops and so on, and then other crops that are used for storage and fermentation and so on. So you really want to have a really great uh, annual system. And these are the locations in our, in our yard where we've got annual systems. So this story about the quality of the picture, I don't know what happened there, but this is a part of our main um, vegetable garden. We've got a number of raised beds in our system. These are 10 feet long by about 40 inches wide. And, and we used raised, we didn't used to have the raised bed sides. They used to be a mounded bed, but we had so many students coming through that our soil was getting stepped on. It was getting damaged. And, and we love our soil. Um, I'm a real soils geek, did tons of soil uh, health stuff for the government. And, and I really wanted to, you know, <clears throat> to nurture my soil and develop it over a long period of time, but it was getting damaged by uh, foot traffic. So we found these, these 10 foot long boards on Kijiji and, and, and basically built these beds. What you see over top of those are actually hail uh, protection because uh, hail is a big deal here. And I'll show you a few more slides on that. But this is our main veggie garden. We've got other gardens. Uh, there it is again, another shot of that. Uh, we get so much productivity off of this garden. This is where most of our storage crops are grown. Again, this is this is spring, probably June or so ish. Um, pictures of that. Most, and and these are all uh, mostly cold climate. This is all you know cold climate uh, crops here. So lots of that. So what's remarkable is in this in this uh, forty inch by ten foot long bed. I typically, not in this one every year, but I typically plant four rows of carrots. And those carrots, you know, if they're thinned judici judiciously are, are enough to last us for the entire winter until the next year's uh, carrots are ready. In fact, I still have a bag of carrots from last year in my fridge up here. So amazing how much abundance you can achieve in actually a, a pretty small space and these are root crops and, and carrots are something that we use all the time so huge you know definitely worth um the space that it takes to do that and and in actual fact it's not that big of an area for such great production lots of crops here artichokes we can grow artichokes which is amazing um, and then we, of course, we use our greenhouse and we'll use that primarily for peppers and long season artichokes and some specific medicinal herbs like uh, spilanthes and so on. We also demonstrate, uh, you know, the use of, you know, alternative strategies for growing food because we do have a lot of folks that don't have a large space. So, you know, we've demonstrated straw bale gardening before, and then this is a basically a potato tower. Um, so you can grow a ton of potatoes in a small space. So we love to to demonstrate that. We also love to use vertical, the vertical edge, right? So we want to maximize our production in a small space. So we do a ton of vertical growing. I'll show you more pictures of that shortly. We even on the top of our flat roofed garage, there's still tar and gravel up there. So it's really hot. And so we put some feed buckets from the farm up there and grew some melons up there one year, which was very successful and, you know, kind of amazing in a place like Calgary.
So we've got vertical crops. We can grow, you know, our, our tall um, corn. We got really good uh, production off of that. And then we've got, you know, tall crops like our uh, tomatoes here. This is an older picture. Um, and then we've got, uh, you know, these tall varieties of peas. I love those. And again, more tomatoes just shooting right up to the sky. I'll probably have pictures of this structure to show you later. And then tall pole beans. Um, we get so much production off of that. In fact, this year it was so warm, we were getting production till just before this last hard frost. So, wow, my freezer and my pickling jars are full of beans, which is awesome. Uh, we also uh, wanted to have some fun with some annual production on our front driveway. So a couple of years ago, actually not this last year, but the previous spring, our neighbors took down three huge spruce trees uh, on their property. And so an area that used to be entirely in shade has now gets eight hours of sun. And it's the only place on our property that gets that kind of sunlight. So we decided to uh, grab onto that wonderful opportunity and grow some stuff on our driveway. So we have some, some of those uh, water troughs there. It's more feed buckets from the farm. And then over here, we've also got, these are perennial crops, actually. These are raspberries, which are now absolutely huge. And then also some uh, asparagus here. And we've got a few more buckets back here that you can barely see that have raspberries, different kinds of raspberries in them. So we've really optimized uh, the use of the space in, in uh, getting some annual and uh, perennial veg out there, which is great. And there's some more stuff growing. Our perennial growing systems um, are pretty well everywhere on the property. Anywhere where we're not growing annuals, we're growing perennials. So uh, those include all of our fruit trees, berries, uh, shrubs, canes, etc., cetera, um, as well as all of our perennial pollinator uh, gardens, which we love. So this is part of the back 40. This was a few years ago, but there's so much food in here. We've created a number of, of food forest guilds in here. Uh, lots of, uh, lots and lots and lots of production. Um, and, uh, and a really good use of the vertical space with the structure. So there's a few more pictures from the other direction here, um, but there's, it, it's, it's very nurturing space. It feels really warm and welcoming, very, uh, feels very enclosed, but produces like crazy. And, and it's been a bit challenging because the previous neighbors used to have um, large, large trees every five feet on their side of the fence and so the whole area that there's still a little bit of lawn left now it's even less than what's in this picture was all completely root bound there was no way you could get you know a shovel in there or anything to plant anything so it was it was really really challenging but you know maybe in another 10 years that'll all be rotted out enough where we can get in there and actually plant some stuff but and then we've got a lot of shady areas in the garden too, under these really mature apple trees. And so we've created gills that are that are almost entirely in shade. And that's been a, really a lot of fun and, uh, and a really good demonstration for our students about what's possible, even if you've got shade. And we're really pushing the limits of, 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 what, uh, of what plants seem to like or dislike. We're pushing them into, into um, you know, these situations in which they may not be getting the solar resources that they really prefer. But what's really amazing is allowing them to demonstrate what they can do. And so um, we've seen some amazing production off of stuff that should not be doing as well as it is. But big part of this is that the soil health is really, really important. If you've got that covered in your system, um, you know, you're, you're going to get a lot more production, a lot more ecosystem health as well. And so that's one thing that we really want to pay attention to in an urban environment is, is that we're expecting a lot of production off of a smaller space in a very short period of time because our climate is so, our, our, our growing season is so short. So keeping soil health uh, optimal is absolutely key. So this is a, another uh, shot from, this is from a number of years ago. The lawn is, is you know, very, very small now, which is good, um, but, uh, but a ton of production. You can see it's very enclosing and there's places to go and hidey holes to, to visit, which is, which is really awesome. We've also got lots of shady areas. Again, this is on the other side of the yard where we're growing things like hardy kiwis. Um, so it gets some dap, much more shade, and much more sun now because the old tree is starting to decline. But this is also one of our mushroom beds. So we've got a few spots on our yard where we're growing uh, mushrooms. Uh, 
edible mushrooms. And so we get, you know, wine cap and we get a naturally, we get shaggy mains coming in. We got blue oyster mushrooms and regular oyster mushrooms as well. And we'd certainly like to increase our production of the, those wonderful tasty fungi. We love those guys. And of course we've got our herb spiral with all of our culinary herbs. I'm French, I love to cook, so I need lots of herbs. And then uh, this is a new grape arbor that we built. We used to have the grapes growing all along the side of, of this uh, southwest facing wall, but uh, we had to remove them because we had to apply a coating onto this wall. So we built a new grape arbor and we really want grapes here. We've got the grapes planted now, new variety that we're trying because these are windows that go into the family room. And with a flat roof house, it gets really hot. So once we get those grapes going, they'll cover this this uh, this trellis, and we'll have that shade that we that we really like. It'll cool down that space quite a bit. Um, and this is where our chickens are going to go in a couple of years. So that's going to be fun. So we also use a lot of techniques like espalier. So we're growing fruit trees on on uh, the the on the you know just on on one plane. So we take up a lot less space. So I've got, this is the back of the vegetable garden, the main garden. So this is a plum and then I've got a pear on the other side. And, you know, they don't get a ton of solar resources, these guys, but they still produce, which is great. So this is the front yard again. I'm gonna show you the transformation, quick transformation that we did on our front yard to show you what's possible in a, in a, in a front yard landscape. So, you know, I was, I've been teaching permaculture and with my classes through Urban Farm School and I was starting to get that, get that little guilt on, you know, about having all this grass in the front yard. I thought, oh, you know, you could do so much more with this, so much more with this. And I was trying to, you know, convince my partner Christian to buy into it because it was going to be a lot of work. And he said, oh, I don't know. I can't really see it because I don't know. I can see it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll just draw you a quick picture. So, so I, I, oh, did I not put that in? There it is. There's the quick picture I drew him. You could see it was a quick picture because it's on the back of a piece of scrap paper. And this was my vision for it. And I thought this could be really beautiful, really super productive. And, and our, you know, even our neighbors were a little bit concerned because we were starting to take out all the grass and so on. And, and so I had this little picture. I said, no, this is, this is kind of the plan. And it's remarkable how similar it actually ended up. Um, but this little tool, this little drawing was key to getting my resources, my, my human resources on side to, to carry out the project. So, uh, so basically we, we decided to leave just one little strip of grass as a pathway because we had a little bit of, of topography here, a little bit of a slope, we wanted to stabilize that. And it also meant that we didn't need to bring in uh, additional resources to create a pathway. So this is what we started with step by step by step, a little bit at a time that big spruce tree came out. We planted quite a, um, a mature, not hyper mature, but you know, mature uh, small uh, fall red apple and, uh, and, and basically started to build the guilds around that and started to create more ecosystem dynamics. We actually had a big hugel uh, bed here uh, early on before the spruce tree came out to act as a carbon and, and, and water storage resource for that tree because we know how the water moves down our property. It moves like this. So we leveraged that uh, in, in building a hugel culture and allowing for that to to nurture and support our tree, which came in the following year. And one of the strategies that I like to use in urban permaculture designs is really to focus on those key anchoring species and, and, and try to get as large of a, a, a tree as possible just for those anchored species. So now you've got something that, um, you know, depending on where your soil was at, in this case, we wanted to go big because we had so much carbon in the soil already from that spruce tree, all the roots decomposing and the, and the, uh, and the, the grinding of the stump allowed us to, to get a lot of that mulch into the soil. And so we wanted to get in a mature enough tree that could take that level of, of fungal dominance and thrive, and it has. So, so those, those were some of the stages there. Um, and then we, you know, we built this, this arbor in the front and, and, and you know, scored these on Kijiji, these, these uh, rocks, and just allowed the, the, the plantings to mature and continue to grow now. Uh, I wish I had a recent picture, but now these the hops are completely covered. This tree produced more fruit than we possibly could use this year. 
And, and we've had so much production of food and berries in, on this front yard. And it's just, it's attracted so much attention. So uh, our neighbors love it. We love it. It's, 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 it's a pretty awesome space to spend time in now. And, uh, and, you know, people will stop with their, they'll come around with their cars or their bicycles in the cul-de-sac. And, and it's so, it's so wonderful because they'll stop and they'll say, Oh, you have a beautiful garden. And, and I say, Oh, thanks. But did you know that most of it's edible? <laughs> and they're just like, what? And I, and I love that because it just shows that, you know, um, creating resilient and abundant landscapes can also be incredibly beautiful and they can fit very well into an urban environment. So lots of cat mint here. We want to bring our pollinators to uh, the apple trees. And cat mint is just one of my all-time favorite plants to use in permaculture designs because it's got like six different functions and, uh, and just rocks it out. I just really love it. So, um, and the not the least of which is as an aromatic pest confuser species because we do get rabbit and deer on a regular basis in our front yard. So there's a few more shots of that. Lots of productive areas in here. Again, lots of shots. Yeah, and so it's really, it's it's just, uh, it's really fun to watch it evolve through the seasons. So we've also got, you know, those beds I showed you a little bit earlier on the, in the front yard. You know, we get rabbit and deer, um, as I mentioned, regularly, and they'll regularly bed down in our, in our lovely planned ecosystem in the front. And, you know, it's interesting because when I, my first strategy initially when I designed the front yard area, was um, let's keep the deer out. Let's do everything to keep these these uh, browsers out of the system. Um, and so honestly, most of the plants that we have out there aren't really that attractive to them, depending on the time of year. Um, but then I started to shift gears. I thought, well, wait a minute. Um, and this speaks to a question that came up yesterday in yesterday's sessions around how do you, you know, if you don't have animals in your system, how do you manage the fertility cycles? So of course we do, we have a lot of ton of nitrogen fixing plants in the system, um, but uh, what I do is I always grow extra kale. And, um, and both of these critters really love kale. So what I do is with that extra kale, I will strategically place that kale in my food forest system, in my forest garden system, in the front yard, um, in areas where I want nitrogen deposits because they will come in and they will eat that kale and every time they eat, they leave poop behind. They leave a nitrogen deposit behind. So I've really switched my attitude around that as to how to get fertility in the system, um, leveraging the resources that are already in place. So, you know, that's something to consider. It's kind of counterintuitive to what you might think would work, but these are my guys. These are the ones that are giving me that, that resource. I don't have to go looking for it. They'll come to me if I provide them what they need. And I know that, you know, all of the other things, they won't touch currants. Um, Hascaps they'll only go after if they're really hungry. They will eat some of the uh, apples off the tree in the fall, but the, the biggest danger is with smaller trees. You do have to protect those in the early stages, which again speaks to perhaps the importance if you've got animal pressure, wildlife pressure, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring in larger species, the largest you can afford basically, because they've already got that woody, that woody bark. And so they're gonna be a lot less likely to succumb due to uh, browsing pressure. So uh, that's something that, that we do. And you noticed in one of the previous slides with the raised corrugated beds, I can put tender stuff up there uh, that the rabbits can't reach that, and the stuff that the, that the deer don't love. So, so that's, that's another strategy. <clears throat> we also use this kind of system. This is also in the front yard. This is a demonstration system, basically. Uh, I used to grow, um, you know, spinaches and lettuces and things because it's mostly in shade for like for, for part of the day. It only gets maybe two hours of sun early morning and then a little bit later in, in the day. Uh, but now it's all planted to strawberries. And so these are really easily lift offable little structures up top that just keep the browsers off. And it's super, super simple. So anyone can do this in their front yard if they've got animal pressure. Again, we've got another espalier apple tree here that produced beautifully this year for us. So when it comes to abundance, um, you know, the big strategy in our climate is leveraging seasonal currency. We have to know how to optimize seasonal, our use of seasonal currency. So what we want to do is optimize the use of our biological resources 
through the entirety of our short growing season. And by biological resources, I mean the organic matter, the microbes, the roots in the soil, you know, getting compost in there that's microbially diverse. So we're, we just, we love making really um, high test thermophilic compost that's just loaded with microbial activity. We use a lot of cover cropping as well. And so we want to keep that nutrient cycle humming. Um, so, so that's a really key uh, strategy. It's slightly different for the perennial systems as they, than they are with the annual systems. But that keeping those, keeping that happy, the biological, you know, um, resources in cycle and keeping our microbes happy is the key for us to, um, to get, get the abundance that we need. So we also cap restore and optimize the use of our water resources. We've got 4,000 bleeders here, another thousand at the side of the house where our neighbors are, are going to be giving us their water next year. We've got probably another I don't know, 500 or so between our, our neighbor's garage and our garage. And also every structure on our property is a water harvesting uh, machine, every single structure. And so, oh, actually maybe, maybe the, um, oh no, it is done. The tool shed just got done. So, so that's key. We realize how valuable this resource is. And, and so we use, you know, we'll use a drip system here that runs off um, our, our totes. And so we're, we're, we're putting that in underneath the mulch. We're making sure that we're, that we're covering our soil, that we've got good soils, uh, sponge in there. And we're, we're really realizing, cause, cause I mean, we had like serious drought this year, like most people did. And, um, you know, those water resources, which we were able to capture in the early spring, um, were invaluable. We had full tanks, almost full tanks, uh, for this year, which was, which was great. And we needed that. So, uh, so that's really key for us to get the kind of abundance uh, that we require. So all of our water harvesting strategies are in place. So we want to capture and store and optimize the use of our solar resources. So, you know, we have a short season. So how do we capture those solar resources um, on our property? We can use, you know, some, uh, some season extension, some, some uh, microclimate awareness, you know, where can we optimize the use of not only the sun, but the heat um, in those heat loving crops, but also we want to capture and store that solar energy in the food that we grow. That's the key. We've got good soil. We've got good water. Can we capture that solar energy in that food? So that's what it's all about when it comes to us, when it comes to the solar resources um, on our property is really how do I, we optimize the use of that and get it into our food. So in our short season, we have to start our uh, a lot of our seeds indoors and get the ones that are direct seeded outdoors in in time in so that they've got chance to mature in our short season. So we're, you know, extending our growing seasons as much as possible. So you get good at those kind of season extension strategies. And then also knowing, you know, when things when you're going to have abundance of a particular crop um, within your season. And when you when you do this exercise, you see that holy cow, you know, this is when cabbage is available for me to eat uh, fresh out of the ground. Um, and other than that, it's not really, it's not growing in these seasons in our climate. It's just not. So, so if, if this is all I'm relying on, I'm kind of hooped. So obviously I have to find ways to, to capture and, and not only capture, but store that solar energy. So we grow a lot of vegetables that can be cellared. You know, they can also be in fresh, but they can be cellared. So our main uh, strategy in our main garden is to uh, is to produce um, crops that can be cellared. Um, but then we also grow a ton of other stuff that can be preserved in various other ways. And, and that's the thing is that how many ways can you preserve your food? And, and that, you know, we, we have so much abundance. We don't even know what to do with it half the time. And I mean, I just become a, you know, a food processing machine. Uh, you know, canning and pressure canning and dehydrating and freezing and making soups and stews to kind of get it all in one meal. And, and so it's, it's really, really fun to see how much you can produce, how much abundance you can produce enough so that you can share the surplus. Every time people come up, my, my kids, I've got four kids, they're all great cooks. They always go home with armfuls of veg or they come here and they cook dinner for us and they're always just harvesting. It's so fun, but it's, it's really about, you know, yes, it is work. There's no doubt about it, but it's meaningful, meaningful work. 
And, and it's a joy and a privilege to be able to nurture so much abundance on your own property and have the joy of sharing that with others. So anyway, I made up this chart just for fun to see, okay, there's that same chart that I showed you earlier with, you know, all the fresh eating bits. But if I wanted to eat those, you know, that produce all year long, how many different ways can I uh, can I, I preserve that food in how many different ways? And so the diversity of storage is just as key. Diversity is just as important in, you know, sourcing your food um, and, and your ecosystem health and dynamics and, and your storage uh, options. This is what builds a lot of resiliency into your food storage, right? So you can, let, you can, you can utilize the abundance and capture that solar energy and, and, and uh, in this nutrient, beautiful nutrient dense food that you've grown in so many different ways. So if you were to lose power, you'd lose your frozen material. Um, so you wanna have backups, backups to backups. So building in that redundancy. So we do a ton of canning and preserving and just so much fun, um, just coming up with different ideas of, of what, to, what to do with all of your produce. So uh, this was a picture I took. So this was, peppers that were still ripening in December. And these are leeks that were being st stored um, in the fridge. And those were, I can't see it because this thing is in my way here, January. So you could see that, you know, we're able to enjoy these kinds of things long into the season. Um, I mean, these are getting a little shriveled up, but it's still amazing that there were, we had peppers that were, you know, still good to eat in December. Oops. That. So of course, um, look how are we doing for time here? I think we're gonna have to finish up soon. Um, we have hail here, we've got lots of hail. So, so we've got a few strategies in place for dealing with that. It can be one of those devastating things in our climate uh, that you need to build, uh, you need to plan for so that it's not a reactive event. So, so we've got these types of, of, uh, of, of strategies in our main vegetable garden that work super, super well. That's these guys, and uh, they provide plenty of airflow, super easy to set up and take down. And these we leave in place basically from the middle of June to the end of July, and after that they come off. And this is just a, actually an insect netting that uh, that we just put on with clothespins, but plenty of airflow. You can still, you know, have access through the six-inch wide holes if you need to. But it's uh, it's great. We just don't worry about hail anymore. And then we've also so that's the same sort of uh, thing there. These are the panels that we use. They just pressure fit into the side of our beds. And then we've got this larger structure I showed. I told you I'd show you about. So this was a big experiment. Um, our hail protection strategy worked so well in our main veggie garden that we decided to go bigger, go home and, and, and build a quite a large structure for our vertical growing. So this is part of the garden that we only grow crops that grow really tall. We wanna leverage that, that space. And so we built this structure that effects, effectively acts as a support structure for our really tall tomatoes. So we grow about uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 tomatoes outside and then maybe about 10 in the greenhouse. Um, but most of the bulk of our tomato production is outdoors. And so we really like the indeterminate varieties and because they, we just get more bang for the buck um, and they take up less space. So, uh, so we use the structure for support of that and then also for the support of all of the other um, vertical crops we grow. And then we've got those same panels here that are just sort of pressured into a, a barrel vault and we've got some hail netting or insect mesh up there as well. Hey, hey Carmen, we've got yeah. to start wrapping up here. We're getting okay. to the end of our time. All right, I'll move forward. So I'm just going to go through here. Of course, we're really keen on pollinator support in our yard, wanting to create that whole ecosystem. We've also got lots of little hidey holes in our yard where we're using areas that aren't that great for growing food, um, but are super for disappearing if you need a break, which is awesome. Lots of water on our property as well. And we like to personalize our, our property with art. So we've got lots of social areas. We really like, that's a big part of what we do. So family gatherings, permacultural potlucks and events, community events, corporate events we've even had on our property, which is great great, the, the power of, of interacting with your community uh, really is a powerful tool for, uh, you know, spreading the, 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 the beauty of, of permaculture design. So lots of little gathering spots. 
We've got an uh, insect hotel in the front that has a bench that is regularly hosting, you know, neighbors coming over for a glass of wine. We do lots of permaculture tours, eco yard tours. This is the number one way that, um, that we can connect with our community because once they see what's possible, uh, you know, it's not necessarily what the space looks like that people respond to. This is something that I've really come to realize. It's what it feels like for them to be in that kind of space. They feel so much abundance and, and that sense of belonging to something. And I think we're hardwired as human, pe as human beings to, to kind of want that feeling of, of connection. So, you know, that's something that is really... Um, that really needs to be underscored that when you create a beautiful space that is nurturing to you and productive and abundant and resilient, other people will feel that. And it's that feeling that empowers them, that inspires them to want to make change. So we do lots of community garden consulting and education around that and different, different communities, um, all the different kinds of workshops we offer through Urban Farm School. Of course, I teach for Verge Permaculture for their design certification course, which I love doing. Um, I also offer eco-wellness programs for various government and private organizations, which is also a real joy. And then recently I've been um, consulting with a new community here in Calgary that is uh, touting itself as a farm to table community or garden to table community. So the whole design is, be, is just really, really fantastic. So we're designing in food forests and we designed all of the um, landscapes around the show homes that just went in recently. And uh, so it's really an exciting project for me. I'm, I'm really excited to see the evolution of the, of the, um, of the, the community, the city community and neighborhoods. And, and we need, we need to evolve our, our designs around that to create much more levels of interaction and, uh, and abundance in our systems. So also do tons of property consultation and, and design, which is also something I really enjoy. So I think that is the end of my presentation here. And uh, that was amazing. Stop share. There we go. All right, Carmen, brace yourselves because. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Um, first off, where and how did you learn to do all this? <clears throat> Will the course through Verge Permaculture help me in the planning and implementation of this kind of yard and garden? Okay, so the, for the first question, um, you know, a lot of a lot of my base knowledge comes from, um, you know, the way I was raised as well. You know, the sort of the environment and culture that I grew up in, and uh, you know that connect connection with the land uh, that that was really important. I never really felt like I was something separate from that, and so uh, it was important to me to try to to create a a project that was really harmonious with um, with my belief system around that and. Uh, you know, I've gardened for most of my life, um, you know, and always organically. And then my career was all in earth sciences. So, you know, when it comes to ecosystem dynamics and health, that's kind of, you know, almost part of my DNA. But, uh, but when it comes to, you know, the things you'll learn in, um, in the PDC, I mean, one thing I'm really, really proud of with this PDC is yes, you learn the design process. Um, but, but we're also you know, like the stuff that we're bringing in, in in the online PDCs is so comprehensive when it comes to, you know, practical practical models and and you know practical uh, skills and so on. So you know, when I first took my PDC. Uh, I realized that 90%, I was the oldest person in my class, 90% of my classmates had never put a seed in the ground. And that's where I saw I could add value was teaching people fundamental skill sets to enable them to go out and rock it. Because these, these were all young, dynamic, you know, motivated, awesome individuals who, who wanted to go out and change the world, but, but they'd never put a seed in the ground. So I saw that as as my mission would be to, how do I support these people from, from below and, and give them the skill sets they need? And so um, part of that process was me, you know, kind of reconnecting with some of my old skills. You know, I hadn't worked in a long time and, uh, and, and reigniting that passion back into myself really helped me pass that on to others. And so, yes, in the PDC, you will, you will be exposed to, I mean, the content that we have is so comprehensive. I don't think you'll, you'd regret it for one moment. 
Mm-hmm. Kind of like drinking water from a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, next question. Do you have any pest management strategies that you use to manage pests? I think she sings to them. <laughs> <laughs> Do that too. <laughs> no, um, the, 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 the most, the, the best tool you can have is, is really good ecosystem health. When you've got a, a living, breathing, dynamic, healthy ecosystem, you're already attracting in all of the elements that are there to manage that system, to the checks and balances. So does that mean we don't get aphids once in a while? We don't get this or that? Of course we do. But because we've got the natural predators, the checks and balances for those, there's a built-in population control. If you if you if your goal is to eradicate every pest, um, you'll play a losing game and you'll have a very unhealthy ecosystem. So the idea here is to to understand that that you know um, things that we like to call pests. You know, some years like aphids are going to be, you know, everything is cyclical. They're going to be you know a lot more pressure on that, and then other years it won't be so much. But other insects have similar kind of waves, and that they, they'll work it out. So as long as you've got really good soil health and biodiversity in your soil, microbial biodiversity, and you've got lots of diversity of plant species. So the more microbial microbial diversity you have, the more plant species you can grow. The more plant species you grow, and that includes pollinators, the more insect diversity you'll have. The more insect diversity you have, the more bird diversity you have, which is why we've got water everywhere. We want those birds in here. We want to create a whole ecosystem. And that way, the checks and balances are already in place. They're in-house. So mm-hmm. that's, that's our strategy. We, we don't try to eradicate. We try to, we, we're observing, seeing what's happening, trying to figure out, is there a management strategy that is not, um, uh, you know, that, that is manageable for us uh, as far as, you know, um, reducing pressure, but not eliminating it? Right. What are what could we bring in? What kind of what kind of plants can we plant to bring in maybe natural predators? So that's the kind of way we're thinking. Awesome. Um, do the metal troughs that you use heat up? And uh, on that note, do they need more water? So anytime you're growing in a container like that, you need to alter your soil uh, composition. You need tons and tons and tons of organic matter in there, um, and uh, and and should be like almost you know like around half soil, real soil. You need soil. You don't want to be growing in a soilless medium because you need that sand, silt, and clay. You, you need those elements in there. That's what provides your mineral um, your, your mineral source. And so uh, when we mix that with really good quality compost, in some areas we were using even, you know, slightly decomposed um, wood, wood chips and shredded mulch and that sort of thing. Uh, lots of organic matter. So and then, and then also, yes, they will dry out, but you, you, you know, with, if you've got that soil sponge in there and you can keep the soil moist, then you're in really, really good shape. So the key to that is mulching heavily on top. Your soil mix, mulching heavily on top. And those, those guys, they do heat up, but mostly on the outside, right? Because they're reflective, which is why we, we chose them. So they don't heat up the same way as let's say the black feed buckets do. Yep. Now this year we actually did some experiments by mixing wool into our soil, and uh, because wool will hold you know quite a bit of its own weight in water, and uh, and it's also three percent nitrogen, so it's a little bit of a nitrogen source for some of those crops, which is great. And then we use some on top as well as mulch uh, to use as mulch. And in the front we found the squirrels were always stealing the mulch, but we used a whole bed of. Um, of wool for mulch in our backyard and they left that alone which was great so you got to get creative Mm -hmm. do you have uh, any specific plant guild recommendations particularly for shady or partly shady areas uh you know that would depend largely on where you live um we've had great success with um like i say pushing the limits we've even we've got rhubarb growing in an area that it only gets half an hour of sunlight a day and it and it does so well it's a really great dynamic accumulator and a water harvesting plant, plus it's food for us. So that's one really good one. Uh, ostrich ferns do really well for us here. Hostas as well, all of those are edible. Uh, we've had black currant in uh, really dappled shade and it, and it still produces. We've got um, 
Oh, there's so many. There's so many. It's just a matter of finding what does well in your area and making sure your soil conditions are adequate for that plant. Cool. Do you know of any potting soil sources that don't use peat moss? Well, there, there are a lot of coconut choir uh, based products out there now. I, I'm still, mm, you know, this whole sustainability issue around, you know, I mean, you know, peat moss comes from peat bogs, which take a long time, but they are local to where we live. And then we've got coconut choir, which has to cross the ocean on a barge to mm -hmm. get to us. So which is the more sustainable option? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think somebody needs to develop maybe a hemp based product. It's an annual crop. Um, that, you know, that if, if it was mixed with some other things would probably make a pretty decent uh, product. It just doesn't have that sponginess. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a big debate. It's a big debate. But I've no, there are some. People, I've talked to a lot of people. I mean, there definitely are well-managed and poorly managed peat um, resources. And, yeah. I mean, it is a perennial system. It does grow back. And so yeah. as long as it's not over... Over harvested. Over harvested. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. And I mean, you can you can grow if you're looking for potting soil or that sort of thing. You can use your own compost as long as it's thermophilic or long because you it has to be you want if you're growing, if you're using it for indoor growing, you need it to come into your system sterile. Unfortunately, it's sad, mm -hmm. but true. But then you can add back in the biology. You can do that add the biology back in and you can add the minerals back in but uh but a thermophilic compost pile uh typically will achieve a high enough heat to kill weed seeds uh, plant pathogens and insect eggs and things like that so as long as you're confident in your in your process uh, and it's thermophilic and you've attained that high enough heat you can use that as a potting soil in an indoor medium but you're not going to use it if you're passively composting you'll just be bringing in all kinds of problems into your system do you do this all yourself or do you have people volunteering slash working with you? And that kind of ties into another question is, are you related to Dan Chiris? It seems you guys maybe share some DNA and being able to achieve immense amounts. Of no, we're not related. Um, no, it's, it's, it's Christian and I, we do everything here. We don't, we don't really have volunteers, although we have in the past had permablets. Uh, which is a lot of fun. That was earlier, earlier on uh, when we were moving our, when we were setting up our, our little greenhouse a few years back. And uh, so, yes, we, we have had an event like that where we've had um, permaculture folks come and, you know, and, and do a, do a work party. So, uh, but for the most part, we, we manage it ourselves. Cool. Uh, do you have any French drains in your front yard or in your front yard? <laughs> no, we have, we don't have, um, any systems like that. And that's largely because we're in a very mature neighborhood. And um, as I mentioned, you know, when I first moved here, there were mature trees every five feet in the back. We, we, there was no way you could dig a swale in the front and the front and in, in the, in the front yard as, as well, or the backyard as well. We can't, we couldn't do it. There were, there was no way to get down to do that. So um, we, we use a little strategy that I like to call pit swaling. And basically, um, you know, where it's possible to dig a hole, we'll dig a hole about a foot deep and fill it with mulch. And, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, if there's any water moving down the landscape a little bit, we can capture some of that. Um, or if we've got rain falling, it'll, it'll settle into those areas. And so we've had to be creative with that. It, it's not a one size fits all strategy, um, but we've got, you know, anywhere where we've got water from downspouts that's being directed in either into directly into the landscape on the surface. So we'll have um, like in the back area here, we've got a large weeping tile that just, that actually sits on the soil surface but there's so much mulch there, you can't see it. Yeah. And that basically goes to, to our main tree species. And, um, but the idea here is that ultimately, if we get the soil piece right, and we have enough carbon in our soil, enough organic matter on top, you know, we, we don't really have to be watering our perennial systems. So it's our annual systems that use the bulk of our water resources. And, and uh, there was one question sort of related to what you're just saying. And where, what is your main water source? It is in fact rainwater, right? Yeah. So except um, in the early spring, you know, we're putting transplants, transplants of seedlings here or seeds in the garden, and we don't have water in our tanks. And that's, that's a challenge with a cold climate like we have, because we can't store that water over, over the winter, anything that we have in reserve. If we haven't used it up, we have to drain it. 
Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, we've just drained all our systems and that goes all into our perennial beds. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's the big challenge in our climate, the ideal situation and, and the evolution of maybe the new urban model as far as developing um, uh, new communities goes, it would be to bury cisterns under the, if, if they want to have a lawn, you know, like put the cistern under the lawn, you know, then you can harvest your rainwater all year round and have that resource available for your landscaping needs. And uh, that's something that uh, if we felt we could do, if we decided to stay here, you know, indefinitely, and it was worth uh, investment to do that, we would totally do it. And if we could dig deep enough, there's still so many roots, big, big roots in our system. But um, but yeah, and you know, in, in the city, unless you plan ahead, it's hard to retrofit something like that because there's so many lines that go through people's yards and in, under, underground. So, uh, but planning new would be easy to do. Yeah, yeah, a lot of hoops to jump through if you're doing yeah, that. Yeah, so in the early spring, we end up having to use our hose water, our city water, because we don't have the resource. Once we get those, those spring rains, those late spring rains, we're in good shape. Yeah, uh, but, and having said that though, the containers that we've got in the front, we have to water those with the hose. Mm-hmm. you know yeah. yeah what are your thoughts on incorporating korean natural farming methods on an urban scale korean natural farming methods are we talking about like using bokashi and that sort of thing or or i'm not really sure um no elaboration that's not something that i know a lot about um yeah, yeah. i've never studied korean natural farming either i know of it um mm. i don't really know what they ascribed to but they probably just use kimchi in their in their soil <laughs> well i'm thanks for that i'm going to definitely uh educate myself on that i really appreciate it okay. how many fridges do you have how do you store so many veggies in the fridge until january so i have a cold storage room as well um i have a, i have a fridge in the basement that i'll because what i like to do because here's the thing my biggest challenge is moisture and I found in my cold storage room, I couldn't get the humidity up where I need it to be. Mm-hmm. And you know, you need like 80% humidity. And so um, so I just, I can't seem to, it's just the conditions just aren't, they're good for some things. Um, and I can store, like I've got carrots uh, down there and potatoes and everything and, and beets. And I've got some of those stored in, uh, in a damp um, wood chips, wood shavings. Oh, Every yeah. year I try something different, wood shavings, sand doesn't seem to work that well for me, tried that, uh, wood shavings work okay, peat moss works okay, but the wood shaving is something that that we produce, because Christian likes to work with wood, so so we want to use a resource that we already have in house, and it's not peat moss, which is great. Um, but then I will take the same thing and put peat moss in a container in my fridge, but I won't, or, or, or not the wood shavings. I mean, put that in my fridge with some carrots in there and, and see, so I'm experimenting with that with the different levels of humidity. And the fact is there's no one size fits all for anyone because, because we all have different humidity levels and different cold, right? Different, different opportunities to, to, to get that, that ideal temperature and every crop has an, its own ideal temperature for storage. So sometimes it's just trial and error, just trying stuff out. And, um, you know, we have a freezer as well. So we do a lot of freezing, um, but most of the time that like the carrots and things like that, the bulk of our carrots are being stored in cold storage um, and some in the fridge and the same with the cabbages, we put those in the fridge unless we're trying to produce seed. And in that case, we'll leave them whole with the, with the uh, root intact and we'll store them over winter in the cold storage room. And then we'll plant them again in the fall, in the spring to get seed. You know what I just learned about Carmen? Uh, I'm not gonna say the name right. My brother told me about it the other day. I think it's like isochromic or iso something or other, uh, meaning that the state stays the same. Uh, So I'm gonna pretend it's isochromic, but isochromic (laughs) freezing. um, And basically what they're experimenting with are putting uh, vegetables into water inside of a pressure vessel kind of like um uh for pressure canning but but it's a pressure vessel that's quite strong and um they can get sub-zero temperatures but because the water is under pressure it never actually solidifies and so the vegetable doesn't actually suffer the the cell breakage that you get in um that's cool. Anyway, it's just kind of a weird science thing. They're, yeah. They're, it uses a fraction of the energy too, because the water doesn't actually go through a phase change. That's um, interesting. I mean, but it seems like it would only be manageable on a small scale. Like how would you do that for, 
for a large scale. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, I, I, they'll probably just use it for freezing bodies so that they can reanimate. <laughs> years. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, everybody's everybody's situation is so unique. You have to, you you have to experiment. And and for me, I mean, I live in an old in an older home, and um, yeah, I mean, I've got the root cellar, which is great. It was there when I when I got here, thank God. But uh, it's been tough to regulate the temperature in there and and the humidity as well. So I've got some work to do. So here's another question. Um, I grew up on Western convenience foods. How do you suggest that we learn how to actually use the abundance? Oh, if you like to cook, you'll have no problem. That's the issue is, you know, um, I'm French, so I love the slow cooking. I, lo I love to extract the most flavor from my food and, um, and I'm willing to take the time to do that. But I think one of the things that, like one of the things I like to do is, and I do it in the fall, it's a great way to use, uh, you know, all the stuff that I really don't have room to store is I pressure can. So I've already got probably three dozen jars of, of different kinds of soups um, that I'm going to use when we start with the November PDC, because I don't have time to cook you know, that much when I'm teaching. And so, um, so I'm able to capture that abundance um, and, and, and in, in ways that are delicious and, and you can do soups and stews and all that kind of thing. If you don't have a pressure can, your whole, um, your whole food thing will, will totally change. Yes, it does require effort, but, um, but it's, it's as close to a convenience food as you can get, you know, if you're just wanting to grab something and eat it. Um, it's pretty good. So yeah, it does take, it's worth investing time learning how to, how to prepare this beautiful food that you grow. And I would suggest you start with something really, really simple, something easy and, uh, and, and learn to rock out that one ingredient, you know, mm -hmm. um, cause there's so many ways to cook a carrot, uh, so many ways to incorporate a carrot and, 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 uh, and it's just one of my favorite veg. It's crazy. I mean, wh when we actually feed people real food, if they are only used to eating what comes out of the grocery store, it doesn't take much convincing. No. The reality is, is that there really is almost no food available to buy, even if you're buying it from, you know, yeah. reputable grocery stores. The, yeah, um, absolutely. I should say there are a few grocery stores that I frequent that have really good food because they're actually going and sourcing it from farms that are growing properly. But yeah. But it's still being able to go out in, you know, mid August, end of August and steal a few potatoes from under a mound. I know so it's the best. There's nothing better than yeah. that. And also, you know, uh, a study I read recently from the States uh, was that the nutrient density of our food in the past 15 years has decreased from anywhere from 40 to hundred percent wow. by that much. So when you think about, I mean, that all comes down to, uh, you know, the, the large scale industrial agricultural model and the large scale abuse of the soil, the fact that we're growing food in dead soil, and the only nutrients that are available are the ones that are being applied in water soluble form. It's a very limited profile. When you look at what you can grow in your own garden, you know, your veggies are able to take up, you know, like, as many 70 different kind of minerals in, in your soil, provided you've got living soil with lots of microbial biodiversity. So the most nutrient dense food on the planet, on the planet is going to be the stuff you can grow in your backyard because you can control every process from start to finish. And so when you look at, you know, all the health issues and the, and the, you know, the um, large scale depression and anxiety uh, models that are starting to demonstrate now, uh, be demonstrated now, you know that, you know, that those are largely connected with microbial uh, diversity in our, in our gut, and we can't separate our soil health from our gut health. So if we want to live, you know, uh, healthy, long lives, uh, and happy lives, we need to be eating nutrient dense food. And that's just the bottom line. It's the most basic gift that this earth gives us. And, uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're, it's worth it. It's worth the effort. It's worth learning how to prepare those foods um, and starting on that journey. Mm -hmm. There was a study I read, oh, it must've been five or six years ago now, um, um, of some Africans who, vegan Africans who were quite healthy living in Africa on a vegan diet. And then they moved to the US, yeah. uh, ate almost the same foods, but got uh, deathly ill. Yeah. Um, and when they actually dug into what was going on, the difference was that in Africa, they actually had bugs and microbes on their food. And so yeah. they were actually not like, necessarily purely vegan because they were eating bugs and microbes to kind of complete their diet. And then when they came to the States, 
coming back to your point on 100% loss of nutrients. I mean, most of the vegetables that are grown in an industrial way are basically just plants that are grown in sand, sandy soil and yeah. fed a hydroponic diet. Um, and then they're double and triple washed because the hydroponic fluids are typically human sewage. Yeah. Um, and so they're scared of pathogens, um, you know, ent entering into the food system, which yeah. I think I just recently read that there's hundreds of thousands of pounds of turkey recalled over, you know, that's, that's on the meat side of things. But um, mm -hmm. I mean, the reason to do it, the food's not safe. There's no nutrition, doesn't taste good. Uh, it's getting more expensive. I mean, you, the, the supply yeah. chains are falling apart. You really can't like how many more excuses do people need <laughs> to go out and, and start to, to yeah, manage man. their supply chains? Like the time is now we have to do it. And it's not as hard as it looks, um, yeah. especially when you've got guides like Carmen who can kind of take you along the path. Well, and you know, some people say, well, I, 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 I'm not a garden or I don't have the room to garden or whatever, but somebody some, like creating connections, that's where it comes in. Somebody in your neighborhood loves to grow food. And, and maybe you can create a hyper-local source for something and, and, and create this, this sort of trade economy hyper-locally. And so the fact is, is that if we can embrace this idea that, that growing our own food is a privilege, not a chore, it's not a hobby, it's a, it's, it's a privilege and it's a beautiful lifestyle that you create for yourself in, in, in doing so. And so that's something that requires a, a bit of a shift at the end of the day. Yeah, we've got uh, two very, very quick questions. We're, uh, we're a little bit over time, but uh, room for two more. Um, one of them is um, a lot of people were really loving your slides and wondering if um, you could, they're asking for permission to, for you to, to host your slides um, and wanted to field that question to you. Um, but also wanted to point out that Carmen is a star instructor in our PDC. <laughs> and, um, she is, she is the, aside from Rob, the main show. <laughs> oh no, it's Carmen. Carmen's the main show. She looks way better than me and she's way smarter than I am. So, um, as far as the slides go, I think, um, I mean, certainly if you buy the bundle, um, you'll get all of those. Um, these are slides that I use in my urban farm school workshops. So I don't typically um, distribute those willy nilly, but um, they're also completely available to you if you sign up for the PDC. Thank awesome. you. And last question is, when are you moving to Yoford? When am I what? Moving to Yoford. <laughs> <laughs> when the right property comes. <laughs> We're working on it. Oh, okay, God. Cox, Carmen, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you guys too. And, Love um, you both. And uh, yeah, I'll be tuning in for most of the rest of the summit. So anxious to listen to um, all of the awesome presenters you guys have organized for this. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be awesome. And it's been really fun. Thank you, Carmen. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you. Yeah, take care, guys. Bye. Oh. Another great presentation. Awesome.